not being angry. That's in the chapter against being angry. Because in the analysis of anger, the, the fuel of anger in the Buddhist analysis is a feeling of mental discomfort that gets you when you see something happening that you don't want to happen or something that you do want to happen, you're frustrated that it's not happening. And so the Buddhist approach to that is to be very aggressive before you're angry about either stopping it or making it happen, you know, the, the bad or the good thing, and very radical and forceful even, which is, makes it different from some sort of don't be angry, be a martyr complex that people are always afraid of, especially in our culture, women are very afraid of, I've talked this many times, and women are afraid that you're just giving them the old Christian martyr thing, like let your husband beat you up, or let your boyfriend beat you up, or let the world beat you up, and that's not the case. The case is, before they beat you up, before you're mad, if you see they're going to beat you up, get after them, and forcefully, you know, get in there and intervene ahead of time. The American way is to be polite with a jerk, you know, who does something, and say, oh yes, dear, oh sure, oh yes, absolutely, and then, and then at a certain point blow up and nuke them. That's the American way. And instead of that, when you first see the slightest thing, like with my old geishi, and someone would splash the soy sauce greedily on their plate, leaving a big wasted pool of soy sauce, he would really give them hell, totally, about their whole life habit, like right over that soy sauce. He wouldn't wait for them to like, you know, blow up the, blow up the car or something. And, and Nina's very, I think Nina has taught me very much this, she's very good, I call it, I call it uh, bodhisattvic rudeness. <laughs> Like, just say it right away before you lose your temper and before the other one has really gotten in a deep hole of asinine series of statements or behaviors. Just tell them, like, to stop being an idiot. Right off. It's worked with me a lot. Because it gets you before you really committed to being such an ass that you have to defend your ego. And, but you have to interrupt. You know, it's also creative interruption. The polite thing, yes, yes. Some moron Republicans going on about trickle-down economics. But you know what that is. You know what you famous uh, at comedian George Carlin. That that's the famous thing. Trickle down economics is drink your champagne and then piss on it. <laughs> and and uh, so anyway, so so that's an anger thing. So then the no worry is, if you can do something about it, why worry about it? And if you can't do anything about it, why worry about it? That's the thing. Then just do something with your mind. You know? That's the key. But that's the anger teaching, that's different. Anyway. How do you put it together with compassion? <laughs> put what together? How can you put it together with compassion? With compassion? Well, the way you put it with compassion, you mean, mean not being angry? Yeah. In the teaching of Shantideva, there's the sixth chapter, which is the origin believed to have come from the Bodhisattva Manjushri, the wisdom Bodhisattva. <laughs> of, the, of the great teaching of the compassion called the exchange of self and other, which we meditated on together. And that's linked to the sixth, that's in the ninth, that's in the eighth chapter, rather. And in the sixth chapter is the teaching of tolerance, chanti, forbearance, tolerance, which is the non getting angry. So before you can suddenly go and be great compassion everywhere, in a way, with someone, you first have to not be angry with them for being such a pain. And so. This, that's this, there's the beautiful steps of how to overcome anger. It's like the blade wheel teaching, actually. It means, it means internally, you take the blame for it yourself. Whatever happens, if anybody's harsh to you, if anybody says anything, if anybody does anything, internally you take the, you say, well, I did it in the past to them. It's you know something I did. I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm not innocent. Uh, I have a past. You know, and you completely take the blame. It doesn't mean that you necessarily go out and like run out and say, beat me up, I, I want to take some blame. It just means mentally you're willing to give in. You're willing to let the other one win over you, whatever. You're able to do it. You might not do it because it might be bad for them in some case. But you would be cool about that, but you wouldn't give in. But mentally you're ready to die if necessary, rather than lose your temper at the person. <coughs> it, yet that's the state of great toler real tolerance. And once you have that state where even the enemy, even you, kind of feel it's so in far out that you actually feel guilty about your enemy because you have done something in the past, the enemy is now attacking you, 
by attacking you, the enemy is getting terrible bad karma. You are growing in tolerance. You're becoming having a shining armor of patience. You can bear anything. And the enemy is falling down in a hole. And you feel badly that you're providing them the opportunity to get deeper and deeper. And you're getting stronger and stronger in your tolerance. And then you might start being compassionate. And then compassion is where you actually just feel the state of another being. There's different levels. There's four different levels of compassion. First one is false compassion. It's some sort of notion like, oh, poor thing type thing. And then imposing what you think they need with no real sensitivity to them. And then there's a level where you understand impermanence and change. A level where you simultaneously understand personal selflessness. And a level where you simultaneously understand bliss and freedom. And then the compassion where you understand that is the really effective one called universal great compassion unconditional, inconceivable great compassion. And that means, as simply as this, it's like I'm compassionate to my hand because I don't put it in a fire. And if it touches fire, I immediately want to f fix it because I, I'm connected to it by feeling. And the state of a Buddha, as I said, when you become a Buddha, you identify with the u infinite universe. And that doesn't mean some blank, empty space of some divorced samadhi like uh, too many Hindu and Buddhist teachers teach, I'm sorry to say. Like a big escape, big selfish escape, actually. What that means is every sensitive nerve of every being is part of infinite reality. Every nerve. And you feel every nerve. And, of course, then people wonder, how can you feel every nerve? It would drive you crazy. But somehow, it's like double vision. You feel it, but you have a bliss energy that somehow enables you to be completely aware of it without it overwhelming you. And it's because you're, you're not one little person receiving it, you're everything. You follow? So at that time, you just naturally react to help others un uh, resolve their suffering. Because you feel their suffering. It's your suffering. It's not, and you don't think you're doing any big deal. You follow? And everyone simultaneously. But then there's about complicated things. Because sometimes people's suffering helps them grow. Certain type of suffering. It's not, it's, you don't want to always do palliative work. You want to do curative work. So it's very complicated and very fascinating. And it is the difference between Buddhism, ancient Indian Buddhism, thousand years ago, and some Hindu forms of Hinduism that were very connected to it, and then the subsequent post-medieval, re-Brahmanized Hinduism, where they re-established